everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our Y&R chat for Sunday, October 29th, 2017. How's our soap opera this week? Are there any red hot lovemaking scenes? Are there any illicit affairs going on? Well, no, but someone did wake up in a hotel room bathed in blood lying next to a dead hooker. Does that count? Uh, <laughs> how's your soap opera? Uh, ha happy Halloween, I guess? I don't know. I want to feel sorry for Scott, of course, but then at the same time, I, I keep thinking as I'm watching this madness unfold, Scott should never have put himself into this situation in the first place. Did he learn nothing from being kidnapped while he was on his last assignment in the Middle East? That little incident cost millions of dollars. It almost cost him his life. And now here he is again a few months later doing his investigative work that he really has no training to do. He has no business doing what he's doing. Any crime organization that would do this, this, to underage women, and forcing them into prostitution is, is a, a crime organization that is not to be trifled with. And here Scott comes along with his laptop and his hashtag and his good intentions, <laughs> and he bumbles into a situation like this. Ugh, Zach is able to use his skeevy evil rat weasel skills to get Scott to blab all about how close he is to busting this whole prostitution ring wide open. Well, it's a good thing that Zach just so happens to always keep a spare roofie on hand. Ugh. Creepo McGee slips a roofie into Scott's beer and the next thing we know, Scott is waking up in a hotel room, blood on his hands, blood on his clothes, blood on the sheets, and N Natalia, the Russian hooker that he's been tr trying to chase, tr everyone's been trying to help and, and to receive information from, is dead in the bed beside him. It was dark, <laughs> okay, it was dark. I'm asking myself, I mean, I'm, I'm you know me, I like to keep things light. <laughs> and so I, I'm shocked to see this, uh, but, and I, but I can't help um, asking myself, is this a little too dark for daytime? That's the poll question that I have to toss out there to you guys as the audience this week, uh, it, it, Scott wakes up in the middle of a sex ring murder scene. Too dark for daytime? I don't know. You guys can go to yrchat.com and tell me if you love this type of story or if you're, you're feeling like <laughs> it's a little bit too much. I, you know, for my part, I, it's a little, it's a little much for me. Um, I don't, I don't like horror. I don't like blood. That's just, it's not my style. But I absolutely can recognize that there were some interesting, compelling, uh, even smart uh, aspects of it. I. I really liked the way this this horror scene was presented with like lullaby music playing over it. It was like very cinematic. The whole thing, the lighting, uh, the presentation, it really seemed like a scene out of a movie. In fact, the whole story, this, the, you know, this idea of him, you know, of us as the audience being shocked as our hero is waking up uh, looking like the uh, the perpetrator of a horrible crime. It did, it seemed like a movie that I must have seen before, or that the, the idea of it seemed very familiar. Um, I will also say that I thought that the actor did an excellent job. It's weird that I, this is a weird reaction from me, but when they came in and there was a close-up shot of him waking Waking up the bed for in the bed for, for one of the first times ever. <laughs> I was 
looking at him thinking, you know, he's really attractive. And, and then, you know, they pan out and there's this horrible scene. And I'm like, ah, okay, well, that's a mixed signal right there. Uh, but I think that the actor did a really excellent job. I remember reading an interview with him in CBS Soaps and Death, Death at one point where he mentioned that he really prefers to do drum, drama. Um, he, you know, his his character coming onto, onto YNR has been a little bit more light but I think this is something that's more in his wheelhouse and I really do think that it was obvious that the actor embraced the situation and he did an excellent job of portraying it I, he was I mean, he was shaking it was clear that Scott was stunned to wake up and and see all of this it was a straight up horror scene the other thing I was thinking when he first woke up in the bed like we saw at first just the shot of his his face and then slowly the camera panned down and you could see that there was blood on his shirt. My my very first thought as all of that was unraveling was, oh Lord, Scott, check to make sure both of your kidneys are still there. I did not know what Scott's reaction to the situation that he found himself in was ultimately going to be. At least he immediately knows that he was set up. I was glad that he had no doubt that he never would have done this. He knows that he must have gotten too close to something and that is, you know, him waking up here was not a result of anything that he would have done. I thought it was also interesting that his first call was to Victor. You're in trouble. I mean, if you wake up with a dead prostitute next to you, your first phone call is Victor Newman. He'll sweep up this mess. And even more interesting that Victor's counter move was to call the cops. I thought that was great. That was um, the right thing, I think, for Victor to do. I mean, Victor is in a place where he's like, I am not even about to get my hands up in this mess for this kid. I mean, he's an employee. Uh, yes, I've already saved his butt once. There is no way that I'm going to get my hands up into another murder scene. So Scott reaches out to Victor thinking that Victor is going to ride in and help him save the day. And Victor uh, ends up calling Paul and Paul busts in to the hotel room as Scott is trying to like, clean up the murder scene, trying to you know, do, do something to buy some time. But Paul busts in. Uh, he's got the gun on Scott. Scott's down on the, flo on the floor. Paul ultimately uh, hauls Scott to the police station where Scott is uh, insisting on his innocence, of course, and hoping that Paul will also presume his innocence and help him get some answers. The only little piece of information that Scott's able to pr provide is the last thing he remembers being at the underground with Zach. So Paul goes to question Zach, uh, wanting to ask questions of anything about Scott Granger and what his demeanor was and what he said he was going to go do. Uh, and as usual, Zach says, all the right things. Just giving enough information to point Paul in Scott's direction saying, yeah, Scott said he was going to go club hopping. And you know, I don't want to say anything that would uh, cast suspicion on Abby's co-worker. You know, I mean, he says all of the right things that uh, on the surface appear to make Paul continue to doubt Scott. There was this weird moment though after Paul leaves where I got the impression that Zach was getting ready to leave town forever he calls Abby though I mean he, he's he's being caught he's just done something horrible the you know the heat is on it seems like Zach should just want to hit the road it's not worth uh, getting caught but he takes a moment to sit in his car and call Abby and leave what seemed like a genuinely apologetic voicemail to her breaking up with her uh, I I really thought that it was it, it seemed like he cared for her I mean I know he's a bad guy and I can't stand him but there was that moment where it's like okay I'm trying to assess exactly what 
Zach's motive is here? Does he have feelings for her? Because he didn't have to stop and make a breakup phone call. I really was expecting we would not see him again. And then the very next episode op opens up and he's showing up at Abby's house the very next day with a big bunch of balloons <laughs> recanting the voicemail that he just left the night before. Seriously though, a big bunch of balloons. <laughs> <laughs> a ma uh, the operator mastermind of, of a of a sick sex ring just had somebody murdered in cold blood shows up at his girlfriend's house the next day with a big bunch of balloons i mean oh balloons well all is forgiven balloons it is the that is the it ugh, and that is the, the cheesiest <laughs> possible thing. I mean, just the, the, the visual of this guy who's, we should be taking very seriously, murder, Mr. Murder here, standing there with a freaking bunch of balloons. <laughs> and I'm having a hard time getting over that. But it was bizarre. He is now completely doing a 180, telling Abby that he's sorry he broke up with her that way. He is giving her a sob story about, oh, his childhood and how he's just afraid of himself and his darker parts. But his love for her is far more powerful and yada, yada, yada. She of course resists it at first but then ends up buying it hook line and sinker they have their first love making scene she's resisted having sex with him all this time and then he breaks up with her and comes with balloons <laughs> making everything all better and she just has sex with him right there on the couch Blah. that that scene made me cringe I never have I even seen a sex scene between two people on the show where there were fewer sparks if, if he was like uh, you know hot if, if Zach were super hot and somebody that you know made me want to like him then maybe I could have got into it I suppose but there's just nothing redeemable about Zach and I don't I don't understand if Weiner is trying to give him some redeemability now I don't know what his motive is I'm not sure what it is that he wants in all of this is he truly interested in Abby does he kind of want to be a better person is is that where Weiner is leading us or are, are they leading us in a direction of he's manipulating her toward uh, some other end I don't know but uh, meanwhile, Scott is having a very hard time in, in the jail trying to get Paul or anybody else to believe him. And slowly, people are starting to think, hey, what do we really know about Scott? I mean, is it possible that maybe he just did this? Maybe he's in jail for this because he did this. We don't know that much about him. All we really know is that he was a war reporter and there were some signs of him, him having some PTSD after his kidnapping. Um, all of that got washed away in the story, but I liked that there was this little thread of doubt, like eh, he maybe he did, you know? I mean, Scott could be a dark guy um he hasn't been charged though paul has him arraigned for solicitation uh for now he gets out on bond <laughs> if i was lord i would be so pissed at him for costing me you know costing some more money and just all of this i mean he just can't seem to stay out of trouble this guy uh but he's out on bond he is uh, you know at, at least able to now try to work on proving his innocence and on the surface I think that it looks like Paul is not ruling out Scott as a suspect, you know, just you know, just because you know, he just because it's his ex-wife's son doesn't mean Paul is going to give Scott any kind of preferential treatment, but I keep thinking that I uh, uh, that Paul may be purposely letting it appear that Scott is the main suspect in all of this to lull Zach into a false sense of security because Crystal is already in witness protection. I would assume that she would have given the police some level of information on who the ringleader of this sex operation is. Alice 
too. I mean, Paul did provide information at the beginning of the week that Alice got up and left the hospital all on her own, so she could be in witness protection too, for all we know. I hope that's the case. I am hoping that Paul knows more than he's letting on to Scott and that he's letting on to the audience because I'd like to see them close in on Zach and wrap this whole thing up next week. <laughs> I just, uh, it's, it's, it's not quite my cup of tea. I, you know, I appreciate that it's been ramped up to very heightened levels, but I'm kind of ready to be over with it. Something about it's just leaving a bad taste in my mouth. Honestly, I, I, the, the best part for me about the whole week was the near knockdown drag out cat fight that Sharon and Lauren almost had at the coffee house. I thought that was really fun. M Lauren knows that her son is in this trouble. She's trying to keep a positive attitude, but she sees Sharon as the source of the problem. And Lauren marches into Crimson Lights to confront Sharon about it, saying it's all Sharon's fault. She's a bad influence on her son. As if Scotty is not a big boy now. Come on. I mean, there's no, no universe in which this is Sharon's fault. And I liked that Sharon stood up for her Herself. She said, look, lady, <laughs> do you really think that I'm going to stand here and take this? There's a part of me that thinks there, that, 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 in a, in a, that in the past, Sharon might have. Sharon might have been extra apologetic, but it feels like a more assertive, a more self-confident Sharon. And she just said, no, I'm not going to let this happen. She snaps right back. Mariah had to eventually end up standing on a tabletop with her cell phone saying, if you guys don't knock off this fight, you're going to be on GC Buzz tonight. <laughs> That part was excellent. That part was fun. Um, yeah, I think uh, I'd like to see Sharon help Scott get out of this mess. Presumably that, sh you know, she's going to help him continue to discover the truth. She did. She is has been a major part of this storyline. I can, I, you know, I would like to see her involved in the resolution. And then together, I would like to see Sharon and Scott help Abby, because Abby is potentially in some real danger here. The last scene we saw of her was the lovemaking with Zach and a shot of his his eyes were open and he seemed like he seemed as if he were plotting something once again i can't pin him down i don't know if we're supposed to be believing that zach really cares for abby and she might be the one to change him or if he is maybe planning on kidnapping her maybe he's planning on holding her for ransom she is a very powerful potentially tool in helping him get away if he feels that the cops are on to him. I, I, I don't know what his plans for her are, what his feelings for her are. I don't want to see something really awful happen to Abby, but I do, I keep wondering in the back of my mind if it will be tied into the actress's maternity leave. I mean, he who knows? Who even knows? Think about, let's just take a moment to think about what Zach did to Natalia. Not only does he have no empathy whatsoever for what he's doing to these young women, that he's forcing them to have sex with men who, and we don't even know like what these men are into, like that's gross. People get prostitutes because they want to pay somebody to do something that they can't get them to do on their own, okay? So that's gross. Who knows what he, what these young women are being forced to do with, well, I mean, I guess I, I'm assuming it's men, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's just, ugh. I mean, that's gross on its own. And then for Zach to, whether he, I'm gonna assume that Zach either killed Natalia or had Leon do it, but either way, what, stabbed her to death? I mean, what, what? Like in what way was she brutally murdered and then tossed into a hotel room as if she didn't matter, as if she was, what, a piece of trash? I mean, just think about this poor girl and what she's gone through. She probably like had dreams of a better life and look at what this girl, what, what Zach had done to her. Do you think for a moment that he would hesitate to do something to Abby? Because I 
don't. I mean, anybody who would do that, <laughs> just I think, would not stop if, uh, if 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 put to the wall. So the thing also that kind of bothers me here is that we saw in the previews for next week's show that Scott is continuing to try to find out what happened to Natalia and hoping hoping that that leads him to whoever set him up for this and he ends up noticing that Natalia's profile picture comes up on design date and then it all just connects like immediate puzzle pieces for Scott that uh, this is Abby's boyfriend's app and Zach was the one who was with me last night. It was Zach. Zach was the one. Zach is the one that's behind this. And then next week we see Scott confronting Zach saying he knows that he's the one that set him up. So once again, Scott is tipping Zach off to the fact that he's on to him and that puts Abby in immediate danger. If Zach reacted the way he did last time you pushed him, Scott, what makes you think he's not gonna react that way again and this time Abby's the victim? How about, <laughs> instead of taking matters into your own hands, maybe <laughs> you should just call the police this time. Call me old fashioned. <laughs> I don't need high drama. The blow up scene between Billy and Phyllis was my favorite part of the entire week. Finally, at the apartment, all of the secrets and all of the lies that have been building and, and creating this wall between Billy and Phyllis were aired this week out in the open and dropped right off the balcony onto the parkway below. <laughs> I thought it was excellent on every level. So, Victoria is preparing to announce Brash and Sassy's men's line launch on the Hillary Hour, just as Phyllis is having cases of Jabot's men's line product delivered to Fenmore's stores, ensuring that Jabot's products are going to be right there on the shelves uh, and when the customers arrive. And I, I thought, Hey, good for Phyllis. This is a pretty good end run. Two can play at this game. I, I liked that that was her move. But <laughs> Victoria's, you know, getting, their Brash and Sassy's getting ready to launch this. And Billy ha happens to notice that Phyllis's phone is dinging an awful lot. He's seeing a lot of activity happening. And uh, naturally, he goes to pick up her phone. And this is, this is his gig now. He just can look at her stuff whenever he wants to. So he goes, picks up her phone, sees a text message from Jack, realizes that he's been had. She catches him doing this thing again and she busts him. He actually had the nerve though to uh, chastise her for making this move and not telling him the truth about it and when he has been doing so much worse in my opinion i loved that phyllis just like stopped that train right where it was and said excuse me the truth you're upset with me for not telling you the truth let me tell you about the truth <laughs> I know everything that you have done. I know that you used my laptop to hack in on Jabot's servers. I know all about it, and Jack does too. Let me tell you another little thing about the truth. The truth is all of this is about Victoria. It's about your love for Victoria. Oh yeah, and of course, your desire for revenge against Jack, but this is all about Jack. It's all about Victoria, and none of it is about me. Your desire to do all of this overrides your love for me and then she smacks him <laughs> she was really on her galloping on her high horse there in that scene it was it, it felt a little bit like Billy was a schoolboy <laughs> getting in trouble for lying like she was 
scolding him. She might as well have had her finger wagging in in uh, his face. It was uh, it was a little bit of a bizarre dynamic. But as they're having this argument, she lets him start to figure out that Brash and Sassy's men's line is about to be crushed by Jabot. And in a not so surprising move, Billy decides to grab his phone in the middle of this argument and take a little break to call Victoria and warn her. And oh, that was Phyllis's last straw. She literally grabs him, throws him out the front door, and tosses a pile of his clothes in his face out after him, slams the door. <laughs> and, uh, all of these scenes, all of them, had this really like physical, high intensity, but also borderline comedic vibe to them. Like she, like when she tossed him out the front door, she jumped up onto the couch and over him to open up the door to physically grab him and toss him out into the hall. And then the following episode, we had Billy trying desperately to get back into the apartment so much so that he jumps from the apartment upstairs onto the balcony outside of their apartment. Like, I, like literally just jumping down off of a, 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 a multi-story building <laughs> to get onto the balcony to try to pry his way inside. And don't even, Phyllis is not even having it. Like he, she won't even pour him a cup of coffee after all of this. He finally gets his way into the apartment and she is just comedically making this giant pot of coffee knowing that her life is in shambles and she pours herself a big cup of coffee and Billy holds out his cup like hey man give me a cup too and she just looks at him and pours the coffee down the drain it was that was comedic like there was just something about that that was so comedic and then she notices Billy's phone ringing knows that it's Victoria on the line so she grabs his phone walks out to the balcony and just drops it down onto the street below letting it crash into a million pieces like I just think it was great something just I liked the whole vibe I liked the writing I liked the blocking I liked the performance to me that was entertaining that was clever that was giving me a great dynamic I mean this is a use of two great actors it was a, a an it was a unique way to blow up a lie. I mean, on soap operas, couples do tend to lie to each other. There's always a lie between two people and then we're waiting to find out when the other one's gonna find out about the lie. This was different. It was a different way to approach it. It had this War of the Roses kind of uh, feeling to it and I found it very entertaining. And even in the aftermath, I found it to be um, not just entertaining but also compelling. Billy, after all of the, the, the comedic sort of elements were over and the dust began to settle, then we see Billy pleading his case. He's trying to talk to Vic, to, sorry, to the Freudian slip, trying to talk to Phyllis and really make her understand where he is coming from. And I, I liked that he said to her very simply, you know what, Phyllis, we have a great time together. There are all these things we do that are relaxing and that make our lives together worth living together pure and simple we like each other and at the end of the day we're not together we didn't choose each other because we're saints we chose each other because we're both offbeat and just something about that line and something about that logic made me think you know what i think maybe these two crazy kids might wind up together after all <laughs> and that's that's kind of what i want i would have expected in a normal soap opera universe for Phyllis to just choose not to forgive Billy. Two weeks ago, I just would have chose, assumed that she would have chosen to not forgive Billy and to just be done with him and move on. Uh, and Billy and Victoria just get back together and ride off into the sunset. But that's not what happened. This is a little bit different. And I think... Uh, I, I, I like the dynamic between these two actors. This Phyllis, this Phyllis and this Billy are endlessly more entertaining to me than seeing Billy and Phil, or Billy and Victoria back together. But that's just me. 
I want to see them work it out. I don't know if they are or not. Phyllis ends up uh, packing her bags and going away on a business trip just as, like she doesn't want to be around when the fallout uh, from the brash and sassy uh, Jabot end run goes on. Uh, so she's getting ready to leave town right as Victoria's interview on the Hillary Hour is airing. And that interview was the worst. <laughs> it was the worst. It was so awkward. There was these strange silences and Victoria is obviously out of it. She is slurring her words and right when I thought that the whole thing could not get more abysmal, Victoria stands up out of nowhere and just passes out on live TV. She is rushed to the emergency room. She, she wakes up surrounded by her family. Everybody's there wondering what has happened to Victoria. Is she going to be okay? The doctor comes in and basically tells her that she's been poisoned. <laughs> and that it most likely was poisoning through her face. <laughs> if I had to guess, I'd say it was face poisoning. I, uh, <laughs> Victoria realizes in that moment, of course, that it's, it, oh, how, what do you know? What do you know? All of this odd behavior, all of these dizzy spells, everything that's been happening to me for a month now, it is the result of that face mask that I've been testing behind the scenes all these months. It is definitely, definitely not from hitting my head after Abby threw that drink in my face. Oh, no, no, no. So, gee, guys, YNR viewers, are you also totally relieved to find out that it wasn't the head injury, that it completely was a month ago? It's, it's the face mask, you know. Face mask all along, huh? <laughs> That it just it reeks of storyline cleanup, but if it gets us into a better place, then I'm fine with it. Not only is this a major health problem for Victoria, though, it's a major PR nightmare for her company, Brash and Sassy. Crates and crates of poisoned product are being pulled from Fenmore shelves as we speak, and Billy is the one who's left to do damage control. He's handling the media, he's fielding, fielding phone calls, and he's the one who's left uh, to figure out who could be behind all of this. Do you think that Phyllis would ever do something like that? I don't know. I, I like, I, nat naturally, B Billy thinks that it's Jack. His first thought is who would have the most motive to sabotage our company? It's got to be Jack. And I, I guess, at, honestly, at first, I just assumed, I didn't think anybody was behind it. My first reaction was not, oh no, somebody sabotaged it. I just assumed that it was poisoned because they had rushed the product to market. That was a, a red flag to me as soon as they started talking about rushing it to market. But I didn't think it would have been sabotaged. But then my second thought, as it was clear that was what Billy was thinking, was that, well, it's got to be Gloria, right? I mean, that it's completely Gloria's speed. She's done it before. It wouldn't be the first time. She and, and Jack together could have done it. Uh, and that was Billy's thought, too. He uh, marched upstairs to Jabot to try to confront Jack, but Jack was out of town, so Gloria ended up taking the brunt of it. She was she she was truly shocked and and offended by the implication. She she even uh, takes a smack at Billy too. I mean, take a number. Did, would anybody else like to smack Billy this week? <laughs> um, she calls Jack though, and he really seemed surprised to me. I don't think I don't think that Jack had anything to do with it. Um, he, you know, because she said, "Did you? Do, you know, Billy thinks you poisoned the face mask, did you?" And then the look on Jack's face as he said, "No, I didn't. Did you?" So I I don't think Jack had anything to do with it. But Billy's not convinced. I mean, he thinks it's it's all part of Jack's plan for revenge. And now Billy has a very powerful ally in his war against Jack because Victor thinks that Jack was behind it all too. But I wouldn't be surprised to learn that Victor had a hand in it. I mean, like, I could see Victor trying to create this problem for his daughter so that he could ride in and save the day. And wasn't Victor the one who gave this whole beauty line to Victoria as a gift? 
And I'm sorry, but if if this face mask has gone through the testing trials that we saw on screen. We saw women testing this face mask on our screen. And if everyone behind the scenes at Brash and Sassy has been using it, then why is Victoria the only one who got sick? I, last week, Neil had a huge helping hand of it slathered all over his face. Are we gonna suddenly see Neil throw caution to the wind and sleep with Benjamin Hoffman now too? It makes me sad to think of a strong woman like Dina Mergeron being manipulated so blatantly by someone. As the week opens up, Jack and Ashley are wondering hopelessly where their mother could be. She's been whisked out of the hospital after having a stroke. They don't know if she's safe. They don't even know if she's alive. Um, I mean, they have absolutely no leads. They have nothing they can do but sit there and, and twiddle their fingers. There was an interesting scene, I thought, uh, between Nikki and Jack where Nikki asks Jack to consider the possibility that maybe Dina left on her own volition. Maybe Dina doesn't want to be found by them. And that's not a possibility in Jack's mind. Jack believes that Dina would never do that, even despite the last few days, weeks um, of the turmoil that has been within the family. He, They were still on the overall becoming closer, and Jack knows, believes that that was important to Dina, that reuniting with her family was important to her. Um, and, and, and ultimately, even though Dina had spilled the secret about Ashley's paternity and that made everyone up in the family upset, uh, you know, the, the children still love her and she still loves the children. There was also this tender moment where Jack receives a record in, in the mail. He had asked a collector to keep an eye out uh, for an original record recording of that song that she used to sing to him as a child. And he had ordered it as a gift for her. And uh, it was very sad. Ashley, um, Jack was planning to give it to Dina as a gift, but since Dina wasn't there, Ashley brought in this very nice uh, record player so that they could sit in the office, listen to the song, and bond. And it was it was very a uh, sweet, very touching scene. And I I also liked that that was the same episode as as Scott waking up in the hotel room and, and the very end of the episode was the very end of the the record playing so Jack and Ashley are listening to the song and then if that was the lullaby sort of that was playing over Scott's wake up scene and then right as that episode ended you could even hear the record scratches uh, it was a, a you know a, a neat little audio trick um, and I, I just thought that was a, it was kind of a, a cool effect um, and it was a, a, a another another time in between those two storylines uh, was Paul. Paul has, has been busy this week. He, um, <laughs> in addition to investigating the sex ring, does end up coming at the very, uh, on what, Wednesday or Thursday show, coming in uh, to tell the Abbott children that he has a lead on Dina. And Jack and Ashley follow uh, the lead to a hotel in Florida where... <laughs> They find Dina in the lobby, whooping it up, having drinks, having what seems like the greatest time with a couple of her lady friends. So D here, all of this time, Jack and Ashley are assuming that Dina could be hurt. She could be injured. She's recovering from a stroke. And in reality, she's sitting there tossing back margaritas or whatever. I mean, it, it was a little bit of a shock to, I suppose, the audience as well as to Jack and Ashley. Uh, Graham materializes in the background and tells Jack and Ashley that Dina's fine. She just doesn't want to see you. There's no problem here. And uh, Jack tries to approach Dina and she pushes him away. She says, I don't even want to see you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. And she um, just marches off. I... I to me, it just feels obvious that Graham is poisoning her against them, that he has told her something uh, that she, for some reason, has chosen to believe of Graham instead of the children, and that may be a result of her brain being a little bit scrambled. But to me, I just think he's he's the one who is poisoning her. And she, you know what? Um, you know what? I wonder if there's any chance, now, now that I'm thinking about it, 
speaking of poison, that I wonder, would could Graham have poisoned the brash and sassy face mask? Maybe to try to frame Jack for it? Lily told Kane to move on with his life, but that doesn't mean that she has to like it. It's an uncomfortable situation, uh, the, you know, the divorce and the breakup, no matter what. I find it interesting, though, that those papers haven't been signed yet. I'm still pulling for Lily and Kane. <laughs> Um, after discovering that Juliet has moved into the mansion with Kane, uh, she dis she asks Kane if he can uh, take a little break from from Juliet, if she'll be okay to stay on her own while she takes a business trip. Maybe Kane could go over to their house, uh, their former house, I suppose, and keep an eye on the kids. So Kane goes over to the house uh, to do as Lily has asked, and he ends up walking in on Charlie and Maddie having a little movie night. Very cute. Enjoying some popcorn. Just enjoying the fact that they're able to do something so simple as be together and sit there and watch a movie and have popcorn and snuggle and have, have good conversation. Uh, but Kane doesn't see that way. Uh, see it that way. Oopsie. Nobody told him that Lily and Victoria had approved the children to, to see each other. And so understandably I think he flips out. I mean he didn't know anything about this. He thinks he's walking in on uh, the, the teens disobeying uh, the parents. So he's he's not happy about it. Lily and Victoria have to do damage control on, on either end to try to fix the situation. And I do always want to make sure to mention that I like the way Victoria has been supporting and comforting Reed through this. I mean, they had so many problems when he first came to town and it was nice to see her telling him, you know what, I know Kane just flipped out, but everything's going to be okay. All I want you to do is just focus on your next date with Na with Maddie. That's what you can do. Everything's going to be okay. And I do hope that on the flip side, Kane is able to get to that point with Maddie too. I'm sure he will. And, and I would like to see them, you know, bond again. They are working on it. Um, and I hope that they're able to get there. Meanwhile, Lily... <laughs> <laughs> is trying to figure out what's next for her and for her life. She's got this new job. She's going to be single soon. Uh, her kids don't require as much of her attention as they used to. They're getting older. And so Lily's in this position of trying to rediscover who she is. <laughs> Lily goes to the underground and Nick and Chelsea are there. They're having some drinks, having some fun. Lily crashes their party a little bit. <laughs> like Nick and Chelsea are having a good time and Lily's a little bit of a, a rain cloud coming in talking about Kane, complaining about him and she is there they're doing their best to listen to her and she just sits there with with Nick and um Nick alone <laughs> and she has a little drink, a nice strong drink and she just starts getting loose and starts talking about how she she kind of likes that feeling. She'd like to have a few less responsibilities once in a, in a while. She, you know, she'd like to get get rid of those inhibitions. Maybe have a one night stand with a sexy guy like you, Nick. <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> that just that just slipped out. I just slipped out of her for out of her. I just like to have a you know have. I just like to have sex with a guy like you, Nick. <laughs> It taught, I think it, it, it really caught Nick off guard. Nick, Nick's reaction was like, huh, wait, you, you want to have sex with me? <laughs> looks left for Chelsea, looks right for, for Chelsea. <laughs> hmm, anybody else hear that? Uh, yeah, Lily quickly recovered. Oh, I didn't mean that I want to have sex with you. I just meant... You know, a guy like you, uh, but I'm sure that that little moment was enough to send all of us fans he heads spinning. <laughs> I, I mean, I like that. That definitely caught my attention. I like mixing up the couples, and I like mixing up personalities a little bit. That scene between Lily and uh, Nick, coupled with the scene uh, on uh, with Lily's guest spot on the Hillary hour where Lily was throwing shade in Hillary's direction every which way coming at her. It just made me think, hmm, I wonder if we're going to see 
a Freaky Friday style role reversal between Lily and Hillary? Like, what if Lily becomes the bad girl just as Hillary is softening up? I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm kind of loving the idea of naughty Lily. Last week after the Newman family learned about Nick's charitable donation, Nick and Victoria had dinner together at the top of the tower and Victoria was there at the table waiting for him. The second he walks in, the first thing she says to him is, so where's your halo? So rude. <laughs> but I thought it made a good quote. Uh, that was our quote from last week. So where's your halo? Uh, six people got it right. A lot of people uh, guessed Phyllis, but it was Victoria. So I got to give congratulations to Justin, Ambreen, Melissa, Henry, Lynn, and Nancy. All of you guys guessed uh, that it was our ice princess. Um, our quote for this week, it's a little bit of just a snippet, a little slice of a, of a line, but I just liked it because there's just something about it that was, it was a, a mouthful. Here's our quote. Endless multiple bouts of fun. Endless multiple bouts of fun. <laughs> I tried saying that a couple times in a row. If you think you know who said that line, go to yrchat.com and leave me your guess. If you get it right, I will give you your shout out on next week's YNR chat. Well, gosh, you guys, I got a little bit of sad news. I'm not sure um, how many of you already know this, but um, I'll just read you the uh, a little a snippet from a, a news report from um, Entertainment Weekly. Um, Daytime drama favorite Christoph St. John is undergoing psychiatric treatment after a reported scare regarding his mental health. Um, so apparently there was an incident with Christoph St. John. Um, he's the actor who plays Neil. And uh, I, I've seen a lot of um, conflicting reports and maybe even a little bit of gossip coming out about what ha happened. So I, I'm not, I, I don't want to say any of the details because they may not be correct. But it seems at this point um, that it's been confirmed that uh, Christoph maybe had a little bit of a mental uh, breakdown, uh, and maybe that's fair to say, or, uh, you know, kind of a psychiatric issue. Um, it sounds like he is maybe in a facility getting some treatment. Um, and I just, I just wanted to, to mention that I, I'm just, I, I'm so sad to hear this. I, I think we do all know, and I don't know if we've discussed it before here, but, um, Christoph and his wife did lose their son, Julian, uh, about three years ago. He, um, had committed suicide. I believe that he had struggled with some um, drug problems uh, in the past, and um, and I, I believe he was in a rehab facility when uh, the suicide happened. And I, I just can't imagine how how that would be. I don't know how I don't know how you could make sense of that as a parent, um, and I don't know how you could find a way to move on from it. I think that's something that would always be with you, and. Um, so I think it's very understandable if, if Christoph is still struggling with this, of course. Uh, but I did want to mention it, and maybe um, maybe we as our as we and our chat fans can send out some some good uh, supportive vibes to him right now. I mean, I'm sure he has a an entire community of his fans that are there to support him now. But I just wanted to mention that I am thinking about him and. Um, of course, uh, we, you know, we don't know how this is going to affect him um, airing on, on the show, but that's certainly far less important uh, uh, right now. Um, so I would just say let's send some good vibes to, to him and, and wish him a very uh, speedy recovery back to a place where, um, where he feels good and, and more stable. Okay, let's get to some of your comments for the week. I'm going to jump into a, a voicemail that Gary left for me because I think this is probably the topic that weighs the most on my mind this week. Uh, Gary had mentioned that Wednesday was the first episode that aired that was written by Mal Young, and it included that dramatic scene of Scott waking up in the hotel room. And I love this point from Gary because this is exactly what I was thinking. He says, 
You remember a few years back when Jill Farron Phelps took over the show, we were seeing a lot of bombs, a lot of blow ups, a lot of action packed storylines that lacked character consistency. Now those types of storylines fell out of favor with fans and then Sally Sussman and Kay Alden took over the show and we saw a return to those character driven storylines, a return to the old and now starting on Wednesday we we did have a real switch from the kind of Y&R that we've been used to. Gary asks, do you think that uh, this portends the kind of things to come from Mal Young? So that's exactly what I'm wondering. I, I, I'm watching Wednesday's show, Thursday's show, Friday's show, and especially when it comes to Scott, that storyline feels, it doesn't, it does, it's not clicking with me. I'm not sure exactly what it is. It's not just the horror. There is something in it that feels a little bit off, and, and I'll give some leeway to Mel having to take over, having to tie up storylines that maybe weren't originated from him and that were obviously part of some sort of problem. I mean, we had Sally and Kay come on, take over the writing of the show. Everybody loved them. And little by little, something happened behind the scenes uh, at this point, you know, that where we and the, as the viewers are just now becoming a, aware of it. So um, I, I don't know exactly uh, what, you know, I, I'm going to give them some, some leeway and hope that this is a tie up and that what we have coming is a little bit better. But there is a part of me that's hoping that this is not the the path that Mal is going to continue on. I, I, again, there were some things that were done really, really well. But for me, I just, I don't need that type of, of drama. I'm so, I'm satisfied with little moments. But, you know, I don't know, I don't know what it's like to have to, to write and executive produce a show. But I do also keep wondering, what is it with Y&R where they can't seem to keep their executives in place? Why do they constantly have to be changing writers? It's not like this on other shows. It's not like this on Bold and the Beautiful. I can say that as the other soap that I watch. Um, you know, uh, maybe it's simply because they have a Bell uh, as the head writer. Um, uh, Brad Bell, I believe, is his name, uh, is their head writer, and he's you know the 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 originator's son. So I don't know if that's part of it, but what is it about Y&R? Why can't they keep somebody at the head of it? Why can't they pick a style, pick a feel, and go with it? And if, for my money, I, I love the Sally and Kay combo that we've had for the past year, and I am a little bit nervous of going back to where we were. I think it's a, I think Gary is a very apt uh, observation that it feels like where we were with, you know, a few years back with Jill, Jill Farron Phelps. Um, Connor left me a voicemail, and I don't know if you still feel this way, uh, Connor, because this voicemail was from Thursday, but Connor was reading the scene where Scott wakes up in the hotel room as Scott actually having killed Natalia. Again, I, I don't know if, if your opinion has changed since then, but you saying that, Connor, made me realize that I presumed Scott's innocence. I know as a viewer that he's been working on this uh, story, but, and I, you know, and so I see Scott as the good guy and Zach as the bad guy, but maybe that's not the case. The truth is, we didn't see what happened in the hotel room that night. Is there any chance that YNR is going to pull another twisteroo and maybe Scott is actually guilty? I don't know how they'd prove it but um, but I thought that was an interesting point I also liked Connor uh, you left a message on the website saying Sharon versus Lauren <laughs> my money's on Sharon uh, I I, I, I want to toss that uh, that question out to the chatters too because it's kind of fun like cage fight Sharon versus Lauren who do you think is gonna come out on top um, I agree with Connor I, I think Sharon might be able to rip Lauren to shreds at this point uh, I don't know Lauren's pretty feisty though <laughs> she is pretty feisty but I kind of like that idea I like that that rivalry Lastly at YRChat.com says, am I crazy for thinking of a Paul and Sharon match? No, you are not crazy, Leslie. I the second I never thought about that before in my life, but the second I read your comment, I thought, you know what? That would make complete sense. I could completely see Sharon and Paul together. Why not? I mean, it seems like 
Paul is a very similar character to Nick and that he's not a very dramatic guy. He's not doing the crazy stuff. You know, they're both relatively stable characters, uh, which you need. You need that as balance. Sharon's the one who's been a little crazy. She's been a little aloof. So you never know. That could be a good balanced relationship. And we never see Cricket anymore. So why not? Um... Harper left me a voicemail saying she thinks that Abby is going to stand by Zach and that him talking about his demons and his bad childhood and all of that is YNR gearing toward an almost sort of redemption for Zach. I, I wonder, see, it could go either way. That's why I'm trying so hard to, to understand what they want us to feel about Zach. I don't, it did seem for the first time this week that YNR was trying to present Zach as more than just a two-dimensional villain character. Maybe they're just trying to make him more relatable so that Abby's hurt is more relatable. I, I think it's, it, it, I, I wonder if she will choose to stand by him. I, I, I mean, I'm imagining in my mind that something dramatic is going to happen to her, but it is very possible that Zach's just going to get caught and she's going to I don't choose to stand by him. I don't know how she could, though, because it, what he's done is so awful. I mean, ugh, ugh. I also liked Harper, your prediction. Um, Harper says she, she thinks that Dina is putting on an act to throw Graham off. I mean, that's possible, too. I would love to think that Dina is still sharp and that she's just doing what she has got to do to lull Graham into a false sense of security so that she can, you know, do what she needs to do, cut him out of the will, do whatever, deal with him. Kiki on YouTube also left me a comment about Dina saying that uh, she thinks that, or Kiki thinks that Graham's mother is impersonating Dina. That is something that occurred to me as well. That it, Okay, so Dina is in this hotel room in Florida. Well, that can't be very far from wherever Graham's mother is. Is there any chance that Graham's mother is now, maybe not physically impersonating Dina, but could Graham's mother be writing checks and signing Dina's name? I mean, could they be just liquidating any of her assets uh, You know, on their own? I mean, I don't know, but I, it's not a coincidence to me and that connection was not lost on me that they are very close in proximity to where Graham's mother is. Or is there any chance that that woman's not even Graham's mother? Perhaps she's someone that Graham has manipulated too. Who knows? <laughs> oh, interesting little cameo tidbit from Marianne here, uh, letting us know that Dina downing martinis with those two posh ladies at the hotel room, uh, those other women that she was ha yakking it up with were played by Kate Linder's mom, Esther's mom, and also uh, Tracy Bergman's mom. Isn't that interesting? So it was Dina and then uh, and then Esther's mom and, and Lauren's mom. <laughs> How cool is that? I never would have guessed that. That's really cool. Um, there's a screenshot up at yrchat.com if you guys want to go take a second look and, and see those ladies hooping it up there with, uh, with Dina. Last week, we talked quite a bit about Mariah and Tessa, and so I want to, even though we didn't get really any movement on their storyline, I wanted to be sure to mention the comments that I got. Here's a good one from Drat Vanity on YouTube saying, from what little we know of Tessa's past, life has not been good to her. Right now is the best she's ever had it, so I feel like she doesn't want to do anything to put that in jeopardy. Even if things aren't perfect, even if she actually does love Mariah, she wants both of them to find happiness in what they have now rather than looking a gift horse in the mouth and risking it for something they ultimately prefer. Or at least that's my interpretation. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, good comment that maybe, it, maybe for Tessa it's just an assessment of risk. Why reach for something more when what you have right now is perfectly fine. Although Zooperplex left a comment on you, YouTube saying uh, a, a little different of a, of a perspective here. I believe Tessa is a gold digger and latches on to Noah not out of love but out of what he represents 
concerning her career opportunities. We did see that scene. Uh, in fact, we've seen a couple scenes of Tessa mentioning the Newman name or, you know, just being a little interested in what that might possibly uh, get for her. But I mean, it, they're all little seeds that I just feel like the reason we're having trouble understanding who Tessa is is purely because of the writing and purely because they changed directions on what they wanted from this character midstream. And so now we're trying to, as viewers, piece together these little moments that we've had and it's uh, maybe harder than we thought. I also liked Ellen's comment at YRChat.com saying, I think Mariah was backing off from Tessa, both out of her feelings of hurt and her respect for, apparent, for Tessa's apparent decision to finally commit to Noah by moving in with him. Of course, then Tessa wants to talk and say things that need to be said, whatever that means. Mariah has been jerked around. She should have been more direct with Tessa all along, but that must be scary when you're just clarifying your own sexual orientation for the first time. The writers have made a mess of this story. No matter what happens, it seems like people will be hurt. Too bad Tessa didn't stay close to Nikki. She could have used some advice. Um, yeah, first of all, I do, I wish that YNR hadn't changed midstream when it comes to Tessa. I, I just have to mention that I did really like and appreciate her relationship with Nikki. I would have liked to have seen Tessa continue to confide in Nikki and start out on a similar trajectory as, as where it seemed like she was she was going in the first place. But the second point that I, I like uh, to, th that you make is, you know, the writers have kind of made a mess of the story. What are they going to do now? I think it's going to be interesting to see now that Mal Young has taken over, what is he going to decide to do with Mariah and Tessa? Because it's probably either going to, like the sex ring story, ramp up or wrap up. Uh, and I'm, I am curious, Not, I mean, about all of the storylines, but I have specifically got my eye on that one. Okay, so last week we had a poll question, and I don't have it pulled up here. Let me look. Uh, I asked you guys if you think that YNR should keep Jordan or dump him. We saw Lily dumping him the, the, this past uh, week. So I wanted to know if the YNR chatters want to dump him or keep him. 64% of you guys said Jordan should be dumped. <laughs> Uh, 36% saying keep him. Um, I liked, uh, even though this is a, min a minority, Justin left me a comment at yrchat.com saying, I really believe the character of Jordan has the potential of having a great storyline and being a big part of YNR. Many, uh, many, many times, many characters begin slow and develop into a memorable part of YNR. Hillary, for example, was a character I thought would run her course soon, but look how far she's come. I do like that point. I mean, because as it is right now, I think YNR has been floundering on Jordan, and that's probably why most of us are like, meh, done. Uh, but I think you're right. It would take, they all they need to do is work on him. Jordan needs some work. If they choose to invest in him, then there's a myriad of potential storylines that he could be involved in. Um, but they haven't done that yet. Marianne has an interesting idea, though, at YRChat.com saying uh, YNR should dump Jordan or pair him with Chelsea and put both of them on recurring until they find a new Adam. <laughs> Chelsea used to be one of my favorite characters, but she's fast forwarding material since she's been paired with Nick. Strangely, since Adam has left, she's had more chemistry with Jordan and vice versa. Send them on a fashion tour. <laughs> um... Chelsea is a nice girl now. Chelsea does not have a lot of drama happening on her way. But it's, you know, when when Chelsea and Nick first had their little sparks of a relationship, we were all kind of interested in the possibility. And it just, it's just not really ramped up to be anything passionate. I don't feel passionate about Nick and Chelsea. They're fine. You know, they're just, you're, they're kind of just a nice couple but there's no drama there there's nothing to really like sink into and feel passionate about i guess when it comes to between them well if, if yr were to pair chelsea and jordan together which i i think is it has some potential that would also free up nick maybe to pursue something with lily t nicole at yrchat.com says i remember a while ago when adam was still around yr did a show where there was an alternate universe 
In this show, they had Nick as the CEO of Newman, and Lily came in as his mistress slash wife slash partner kissing up on Nick. So, hearing Lily make that comment about wanting to have revenge sex with a guy like Nick makes me think back to that episode. Would be interesting to see them together. I'm not feeling that Nick and Chelsea pairing. I remember that too. I wonder if Y&R had, maybe even the actors, had it in their mind that Nick and Lily would make a, a spicy couple and maybe they uh, are deciding to test those waters now. Diana left a comment at YRChat.com saying, I have to say, I found Lily's comment to Nick about wanting to have re revenge sex with a guy like him a little sleazy. Even Nick seemed quite shocked at what he heard and seemed uncomfortable by the comment. It was also disrespectful to Chelsea as she knows that Chelsea and Nick are a couple. Maybe I'm the only one that feels this way, but it also bothers me that Lily refers to it as revenge sex. As we all know, she's already cheated on Kane on more than one occasion. As far as I'm concerned, they're already even. Sounds to me like Lily just wants an excuse to have meaningless sex with someone hot. Absolutely, Diana. Lily just wants an excuse to have sex with someone hot. I agree. I do agree about that. And, and you know, I, I also do agree that it was disrespectful toward Nick and Chelsea's relationship. Absolutely no question about it. If, if this were reality and I was viewing what Lily did, I would be like, that was a little shady. But since it's a soap opera, of course, I'm just eating it up with a spoon. I think I'm gonna, I will have to chalk some of it up to the fact that she was drinking. <laughs> they made a point of saying that what Lily was drinking was strong. So I'm kind of guessing she just, it slipped maybe. And she, she lost her inhibition for that moment. James, I'll end on this one because I think this is pretty good. James at YRChat.com says, this might be a stretch, but I'll put it out there anyway. Could Billy figure out that Phyllis went to Dallas and follow her there to try to make up? And when she, re and when she turns him down, could Billy somehow end up in bed with Lily? That would be kind of juicy too. Not gonna lie, I do, I, I still am rooting for Billy and Phyllis, but I have thought in the past when there were hugs and stuff between Lily and Billy that they would be a very interesting couple too. The most exciting thing perhaps about having new writers to me is the potential of mixing up the couples. I like stories about romance. I like, you know, hot, passionate, you know, love making and affairs and stuff like those and, I, and you know I like the business storylines too those are the ones that speak to me but the one of the exciting things about having new writers is the fact that we might have a new vision and that we might be able to reimagine some of the relationship dynamics that we've you know gotten used to and some of which that have gotten stale Okay, everybody, that does it for me for this week. I do hope that you guys enjoyed the show um, and that you can appreciate uh, some of the things that maybe Mal was trying to do, even though we're not fully into the full stride of what he's completely capable of. So we'll see what next week uh, has to offer us. If you'd like to comment on the show as it's unfolding, you can go to yrchat.com. There's always a discussion happening there. Uh, or, of course, you can um, message me on the social uh, sites, or you could call into the voicemail at 309-588-4569. It's really important to me to continue to get your comments. I love hearing from you. And I'm going to be watching with a with my pen and my paper. I'm going to be watching real close next week, and I'm going to see where we are. And I'm going to I'm going to look forward to uh, chatting with it with uh, you guys about it next week. So. I hope everybody has a happy Halloween and that nobody wakes up in the bed next to a bloody murdered prostitute. See you guys later. Love ya. <laughs>